scripture lesson today is Mark 10, 17 through 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear fault witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all this since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give your money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at those words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last will be first through these words our God is still speaking thanks be to our still speaking God Dale, my younger brother, lives out in California. Well, he wanted me to send him the link last Sunday for the worship service, so I did. But 9.45, he gets on there, and it's just him. Nobody else is there. Oh. He says, like, I can't figure out. Didn't you send me the right time? I says, yeah, but Dale, remember, you're three hours behind. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to get up at 6 o'clock. <laughs> Hi, Dale. <laughs> Ever since good morning. <laughs> Ozzy E. Smith, Jr., and it's not always what you think, shares this little story. So there was a commercial where a man was rummaging through garbage, finds a lamp, and he rubs it. And out pops this, ge this genie. He says, you have three wishes. The man says, okay. I want all the money in the world. Boom! All the money in the world's around him, just covering him. He was happy as a lark. And he says, what's your next wish? Okay. Um, I want all the women in the world. Boom! He's got all these women around him. Oh, he's real happy now. He says, you have one more wish. What is it? I guess, oh, man. One more wish. What would it be? I want to live forever. Boom! He's now the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> there are some things, you know, we say that this man had it all. Money, women, and then find that some things may not turn out the way you planned. <laughs> Or is easy to obtain by just pushing for Our story of the Gospel of Mark today revolves around a young man who is rich and powerful. And he approaches Jesus. Well, he doesn't really approach him, he can run up to him. Find himself at Jesus' feet. Then he asks him an essential question of life. Master, what must I do to gain eternal life? Now, this is not a trick question. So often this is the case when religious people spoke to Jesus. This man is quite sincere in his effort to know what God required. He was real, live, and first century a seeker. There's something amazing in the sight of this rich, young aristocrat falling at the feet of this penniless prophet from Nazareth, who was on his way to be an outlaw. But as soon as he calls Jesus a good teacher, Jesus hands him back, no flattery, don't call me good, keep that word for God. 
It looks almost as if Jesus was trying to freeze him out or pour cold water on his young enthusiasm. But the spirit of this man came to Jesus in a moment of overflowing emotion. It's also clear that Jesus exercised a personal fascination over him. Jesus did two things that every evangelist and preacher and every teacher ought to remember and to copy. First, he said, in effect, stop and think. You were all wrought up and palpitating with emotion. I don't want you swept to me by a moment of emotion. Think calmly what you're doing, Jesus. was not reason to man. You're telling him even at the very outer, at outset, the cost that would be to follow him. And second, he said, in effect, you cannot become a Christian by a sentimental passion for me. You must look to God. Preaching and teaching always means to convey uh, the truth through personality, and thereby lies the greatest danger of the greatest teacher. The people get attached to the teacher and think it's an attachment to God. Never to any story, lay down any sense of the Christian truth that respectability is not enough. This young man wanted to be sure that he could get eternal life. So he asked what he could do. His initial response was a rather shock answer. The company line of Judaism, if you will. To these were the commandments of which were the essentials and basis of decent life. And while the young man's answer may sound braggadocious, it's clear that his pursuit is genuine. For without hesitation before Jesus could get to the one about covetousness, the young says, Teacher, ever since I was a child, I've made all the commandments. And perhaps even the kept, the, kept ones, the ones kept by the Pharisees had loopholes in their version of it. They've never done that. Got a t shirt for it, in today's language, basically. So, what else is there for me to do? Obviously, this young ruler was not at the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus located. Murder in the angry heart and adultery in the lustful ear. But in the anticipation of one who thinks that he is on the verge of winning a long sought victory, he asks if there might be something he lacks, something minor that he might have overlooked, just in case. If you take notice, all the questions Jesus asked him of the commandments, except for one, were all negative commandments. And in one exception, operated around the family circle. This man was saying he had never done anything to anyone in the way of harm, and that was perfectly true. But the real question here is, what good have you done? Here Jesus' question was even more pointed. With all your possessions, with all your wealth, with all that you could give away, what positive good have you done to or for others? How much have you gone out of your way to help and comfort and strengthen others as you might have done? Respectability overall consists of not doing things. Christianity consists in doing things. That's precisely where this young ruler, like so many Christians at times today, Fall. Then a challenge issue. Verse 21. Jesus looked straight at the man with love and said, You need only one thing. Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor, and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. And Luke concludes in this way. And the man went away very sad because he was rich. Now, if we'd have been there, we might have been tempted to run after that ruler and work out some kind of, some kind of compromise with him. A man of his means could definitely bolster our budget, folks. <laughs> Yet Jesus just let the guy walk away. Just let him walk away. The teacher moment is not over. He just turns to the disciples and uses a striking cartoon image to point out that the wealthy will have the hardest time entering the kingdom of God tells them, how hard is it 
to enter the kingdom of God, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a man to enter the kingdom of God. So you got the camel is the largest animal. The eye of a needle is the smallest imagining opening imaginable. This portrays the, the chance of a fat cat for salvation is pretty slim. The disciples were left kind of scratching their heads, you know, what in the world? Then who can do it? And humanly speaking, answer to Jesus, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Over the years, the wealthy have, have and, and those that have not been wealthy have watered down that force of this saying. Many have heard and remembered some line about a needle's eye as the name of a low gate in Jerusalem. And they remember that if a camel got down low enough, it could squeeze through this gate. Yeah. Hmm. The rich then take a lot of comfort for themselves that they have nothing to worry about. As long as they can get down low, and be humble. They can say to that this particular rich man was a special case. And it's like everybody else. They, these people, have, they said that to themselves that all these things we've done are use. You know, this guy was a particular case for Jesus. Jesus knew he was guilty of greed. He chose a difficult test for him. We can say to ourselves that we're quite different. <coughs> we didn't hardly need to ask this of any of us. It's so tempting to turn the needle's eye into a, a large loophole. But one can't escape the radical force of Jesus' words so easily. There are people today who are just like this rich young ruler. They are more concerned about their own personal salvation. They want to, to know what they could do to ensure eternal life for themselves. There should be a misunderstanding of what eternal life is. They perceive it to be a, a reward for virtuous deeds within the relationship with God. Now, this young ruler, in many today, it's like a worthwhile investment plan, if you will. They want to set up a, a game plan to achieve an eternal reward. Too many today are not really interested in serving God for the sake of serving God. They're interested in ministry, nor are they interested in ministry to the poor. Their approach is every person for themselves. So the questions also indicate that the person expects to attain salvation based on their own resources. Perhaps this is why it's so difficult for the rich because they are so used to pulling strings and pulling things off with their own influence and power. Cody Lewis in what it, it's Twilight Time, published by CCS Publishing, says, Henry Thoreau said, be not merely good, be good for something. That was Jesus' challenge to the man who wanted to know what he could do to inherit eternal life. He had been good at making money, and being morally upright, and being and keeping the commandments. This is not the ultimate good. He was also given himself and what he has on behalf of others. He needed to also realize that the gift without the giver is bare. John Wesley proposed an excellent guide to goodness. He said, and he practiced what he preached, do all you can, or do, do all the good you can. Be all the means you can, in all the ways you can at all the times you can, as long as ever you can. Interesting statement. By all the means you can, in all the ways you can, at all the times you can, as long as ever you can. Someone else expressed the idea of goodness in a wonderful way, saying, I expect to pass through this world but once. Any good thing, therefore, that I can do, or any goodness that I can show to my fellow creatures, let me do it now. 
Let me not defer nor neglect it, or I shall pass this way, not pass this way again. We've all heard that from all time. And Jesus assured his disciples that anyone who gives us something valuable for his sake will repay it a hundred times over in this life. Although not necessarily in the same form as that poor guy goes to the garbage pile. Jesus explained that in the world to come, the values of this world are going to be reversed. Those who seek status and importance here will have none in heaven. Those who will be humble here will be great in heaven. The corrupt condition of our society encourages confusion of values. You know, we're bombarded by messages that tell us how important and how to feel good. And Jesus, teaching about service to others, seems alien. But those who have humbly served others are the most qualified to be great in heaven. You know, a person has, that may have to sacrifice tithes are very dear in order to become a Christian. But when they do, they become a member of a, of a family and a brotherhood and sisterhood as, as wide as earth and heaven. You know, for Jesus, there is no such thing as quid pro quo. He removes the idea of material reward for material sacrifice. Jesus never offered an effortless way in following him. In fact, he told those following him straight out, to be a Christian is a costly thing. Second, we're told that Jesus never used a bribe to make people follow him. He uses a challenge. Think of the number of Christians there would be in the world today if people accepted his challenge over some of these absurd challenges of our youth and adults on TikTok or some of these other media platforms. There are people today who, like the rich young ruler, Jesus peered at this ruler, peered into his heart, and saw they loved wealth more than all else. And that became the one thing necessary. No matter good works, kind deeds, or passionate prayers could accomplish this. This man must choose between his wealth and his eternity. And he made his choice. A lot of people are making that same choice today. Look at the way the world's going. Look at our country's going. You see it right in front of them. People make choices every day of their lives as to how they will live their lives. And there is a consistency in their choices. Some of them really choose to protect their wealth. Or make choices to guard their popularity. And for others, it's a choice involving their social status, their academic achievements, or their physical appearance. When they take inventory of their lives, each of them will find that one thing for which Jesus spoke. If people would take this vignette at face value, it becomes in a crossroads in their lives. Because Jesus will look at them in love, say to them, you know the possession you hold so tightly, you will have riches in heaven. So if things are as he says, certainly you will get your reward, but you will have to show yourself to be a big enough person and a kind enough adventurer to get it. Remember, Jesus never promised that within this world of space and time, There'd be a kind of squaring up or a, of a balance sheet or a settlement of accounts. He did not call people to win the rewards of time. He called people to earn the blessings of eternity. And God has not only in this world in which to repay. In today's world, people tie the success to the amount of possessions they have ownership of. But we forget that sometimes what we consider it success may actually be failure. John Tenninger, in The Real Way to Personal Fulfillment, shares this little story. He says, more than 40 years ago, I heard a man describe two paintings he said he had at his home. I've never forgotten them, even though I've never saw them. One was the figure of Jesus' story of the rich man whose crops produced so abundantly, he decided to pull down his barn and build bigger ones. And he said to his soul, Soul, eat, 
drink, and have a great time for tomorrow you die. The captain's pain said, the failure that looked like success. The other painting, the companion painting, was of Jesus dying on the cross, the crown of thorns on his head, the chin drooping to his chest, the crude nails in his hands, and all his friends off hiding somewhere. The caption of this picture said, the success that looked like failure. We would all like to be successful and fulfilled as persons. It's one of the dreams with which our culture imbues us. When we listen to Jesus, we realize that success and fulfillment doesn't attain them. Instead of this, there is a, a gift from God. They simply have to do what's right in their lives. In God's eyes, it's a whole lot better to be a success that looks like failure than a failure that looks like success. Tony Campolo tells a story about a friend who had to take a bus trip across central India. India. He was in a very old model bus. And this thing was packed. If you've ever seen pictures of it, there's people hanging all over the place, <laughs> just loaded furniture, even animals in this thing. And sitting across from Tony's friend was a was a tired man who had a neatly wrapped package was sitting on the luggage rack above his head. The man kept dozing off, and each time he, he woke up, he was in a panic, carrying his package in his stole. <clears throat> this went on for hours. But eventually, he fell asleep. And when he woke, the package was gone. Most of he panicked and realized he'd been robbed. But being relieved that the thing that caused him constant worry is now gone. He settled back in his seat, totally relaxed, with a sense of joy, fell into a prolonged, wonderful sleep. The man was now free of that one thing he was holding on to. And that's what Jesus is attempting to illustrate in his story to us. Let him go of things that worry us, the things that obsess us, or the things that consume us, we discover we're free. Jesus makes clear that no one enters a kingdom on his or her own resources. Salvation comes only as a gift from God. And that gift cannot be received when one's fists are tightly closed around one's possessions. <coughs> it's received by those who open their hands to God and others. 